Protestants spend a lot of time trying to prove that faith alone saves us. But often we don't spend as much time explaining how and why faith alone saves us. And from a pastoral point of view, that's actually more important to get across to people, to help them understand how it is that our faith saves us. And once we have a clear picture of how that works, a lot of confusion about things such as the sacraments and how they affect our salvation starts to get cleared up as well. In this video, that's what I'm going to be looking at, how it is that faith saves us, how the sacraments are involved in that, how scripture is involved in that, and how it's all about grace. And we are going to be looking at what the Anglican formularies have to say about that. We're also going to be looking at the Protestant writers that influence those formularies. And of course, we will be backing up what we are saying with the words of Holy Scripture. First, I'll just briefly show that the Anglican formularies do indeed teach that faith alone saves us, as well as the words of Holy Scripture. So in Article 11 of the 39 Articles of the Anglican Church, it says, We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. Now, of course, in the Anglican formularies, justification leads to salvation. So if someone is accounted righteous before God, they will most certainly be saved because God will not damn a righteous person. If you are righteous, he will bring you into his presence for eternal salvation. And the homily for Good Friday says, All they which behold Christ crucified with a true and lively faith shall undoubtedly be delivered from the grievous wounds of the soul and be saved. So not only are we justified and accounted righteous before God by faith alone, but also we are therefore saved by faith alone. And by saved, what we mean here is essentially resurrection to immortality in the kingdom of heaven. Now, all of this is based on Scripture. So Romans 5 verses 1 to 10 says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. So what we're seeing there in Romans 5 is that since we're justified by faith, we're also going to be saved by faith. Our justification leads straight to our salvation. We're not going to say that you're justified by faith alone, but then saved by faith or works or something like that. No, it's always faith throughout the whole process. In Romans 1 verses 16 to 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by his faith. Okay, so since we are made righteous by faith, we will be saved by believing in Jesus Christ. Romans 10 9 says, If you confess of your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Acts 16 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Lastly, John 6.40 says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. So we're seeing very clearly then that we are justified by faith only, and therefore we are saved by faith only. Now, sometimes Protestants unfortunately have the mistaken view that faith saves us because it is somehow meritorious. Now, they're never going to use that word, but often the way that they view things in their own head kind of suggests that that's what they're thinking, it, how it works. So faith is a good thing. It, um, our believing in Jesus Christ, for instance, might show that we are humble. It might show that we trust in God in a, in a sense that makes us a good person. You know, we're not going to listen to the world. We're not going to listen to logic and what, what reason might say about things like miracles and the resurrection of the dead. But we're going to just simply 
uh, trust in scripture instead. And that somehow shows that we are essentially humble, that we're serving God in that sense. And then God rewards us for that with salvation. That is completely not correct. There's also another view pretty much that, well, since mankind can't be saved through works, like actually being a good person in our lives and how we treat one another and how we worship God, God essentially lowers the bar. Okay, all you have to do is is believe in me and that's good enough. No, 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 no. This is really the wrong way of looking at it. And that's actually leading us back to the medieval Roman Catholic Church that the reformers opposed. We are saying that faith has absolutely nothing to do with merit or being good. Our salvation is completely by grace. It is something that we do not deserve. Okay, and even our faith is not something that makes us good, makes us righteous, says something about us. It's not like that at all, which we'll get to. But just so you can understand for now, I want to get that out of your head immediately, right off the get-go. Faith is not something that makes you a good person. It is not something that deserves a reward. It doesn't say anything about you. Okay, what we're going to see is that faith is rather simply an instrument by which we receive God's grace rather than being something that we possess that God then rewards with salvation. So how then does faith save us? Well, first of all, we better define what faith actually is. Faith is not merely believing in the doctrines of Christianity. Okay, We're not saved by intellectually assenting to a set number of dogmas. In the book of James chapter 2 says that even demons believe that God exists and they shudder at the thought. They, they know all of this. They know uh, Nicene orthodoxy, right? Even Satan believes in the Holy Trinity and the two natures of Christ. He knows every article of the Apostles' Creed. He's got it all under wrap and he's not going to be saved, of course. So it's not about believing in doctrine. Intellectual assent can't save us. And if we, as Protestants, mistakenly define faith as intellectual ascent, as believing in the doctrines of Christianity, you can then understand why people like Roman Catholics might wonder, well, how on earth does that save you? That seems a bit bizarre. And you can end up saying things like, if I have, if I'm more theologically correct than you, then my faith is stronger than yours. And that's not true either. Okay. Someone could be more theologically correct than someone else, but still actually have a weaker faith than them, as we'll see. So what is it that we as true believers have that demons, for instance, don't have? Well, essentially it's the word trust. Demons believe in God. They believe in everything that's in the Bible, but they don't trust in God's goodness. And that's why they try to usurp God. They didn't believe that they didn't trust that he was good, that he was going to do good things for them. They wanted to snatch uh, goodness for themselves on their own terms. They didn't believe essentially in the gospel. Right, the word gospel means good news. If you trust in the gospel, that means you trust in God's goodness as declared through the gospel. That's what demons don't have. And also, you can have someone who intellectually believes in Christianity, intellectually believes in all of the articles of the Nicene Creed or all of the articles of the 39 articles even, but they might not actually have a trust in God's goodness. And you can see that through how you might live your life. Are you actually trusting in your salvation? Are you actually trusting in the way that your life plays out, that God has your best interests in mind and that he's going to always do good to you? Or do you actually feel like you're walking towards hellfire? Do you feel like God's going to keep on messing up your life just to punish you? If that's the case, then there's some there's a level where, of course, you're not actually trusting in God's goodness, and that's what faith actually revolves around, that trust. Now, this is, of course, all supported by Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the assurance of hope. You hope in God's goodness, and you have assurance that he will be good. In Hebrews 10, verse 22, it says, Let us draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This idea that true faith doesn't make us hide from God, it makes us draw near to him with confidence, trusting in his love and goodness and grace. 
Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. And in Ephesians 3 verse 12 it says, In Jesus we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Okay, so you see this idea that faith makes you approach God makes you recognize that you are his beloved child in his son and therefore you know that he loves you and he's going to do good to you. He will save you. He will ensure that your life will be the best it can be. And of course this doesn't this doesn't mean best in a worldly sense, okay? God is not always going to ensure that you have the most money or pleasures of the world or even happiness. But he's going to ensure that you have the most abundant life that Christ promises us. And that means a life of fulfillment, a life of service, a life where you are actually able to honor God and bear fruit for his glory. Faith also means that we trust that God accepts us and sees us as righteous. Okay, so we know that we can, even though we are sinners, miserable sinners, we can pray to God and say, our father we can call him our father we can pray to him and ask for things in the name of his son jesus christ and then we have the assurance that he listens to us that he accepts us and that he will answer our prayers now when jesus commends people's faith in the gospel it's not just because they believed that jesus could heal them but it's that they also trusted that he would okay that's a really important distinction so let me make it again It's not about believing that Jesus can, it's about trusting that he will. Okay, so someone can believe that, hey, well, you know, Jesus can save me. It's it's obviously possible for him to resurrect me and make me have everlasting life and take away my sin. It's possible that he can do that. Of course, he made the whole world. If you believe that God made the entire cosmos, it's not actually hard to believe that Jesus can do that for you, right? But that's there's a, that's what demons have. That's what Satan has. They know that God's going to be doing these things. What they don't have is the trust, the trust that Jesus will do it, that he does love you, that he did die for you, that his blood does wash away your sins, and that he will resurrect you to eternal life. That's the trust element. Now, Thomas Cranmer, who's the main architect of the Anglican formulary, since he wrote the Book of Common Prayer, most of the 39 articles, and the most important homilies in the Book of Homilies, he wrote in the 1538 articles, The true Christian faith of which we speak is not only knowledge of the articles of faith or a mere historical belief in Christian doctrine, but together with that knowledge and belief, it is a firm trust in the mercy of God promise for Christ's sake, whereby we maintain and conclude with certainty that he is merciful and propitiatus even to us. This faith truly justifies and it is truly saving. There again from Cranmer, faith alone justifies us and saves us. Often I hear people say that Anglicans believe in justification by faith alone, but not salvation by faith alone. No, we believe in both. Justification leads to salvation. If you're justified, you will be saved. And the homily for Good Friday says, Faith is a sure trust and confidence in the mercies of God, whereby we persuade ourselves that God both hath and will forgive our sins, that he hath accepted us again into his favor, that he hath released us from the bonds of damnation, and he hath received us into the number of of his elect people. So the assurance of faith actually involves trusting that you will be saved and that you are one of God's elect. And just to briefly look at the men who influenced the formularies, Martin Luther in his introduction to the book of Romans said, faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. And John Calvin in the Institutes of the Christian Religion said, We shall now have a full definition of faith if we say that it is a firm and sure knowledge of the divine favor towards us, founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ. It's the knowledge of the the divine favor, trusting in God's favor. Now, as part of trusting in God, this also means that we're not trusting in ourselves. Faith inherently looks away from ourselves and it looks to the cross of Christ. In that sense, faith involves necessarily repentance. We can't actually have true faith without true repentance. Because if we don't have true repentance, 
then that means that you are trusting in your own goodness, of which there is none. If you actually think that by your own merits you can stand before God and actually be accepted by him and be saved, then you do not actually trust in God alone. You trust in yourself and God, I suppose, and that's not going to cut it, okay? Faith means a complete and utter reliance on God alone, putting all of our weight on him, clinging to him only, and not clinging to ourselves. That's what faith is, turning away from ourselves and looking to Jesus as the only person who is righteous. So faith then is a turning of the whole person to God. It is a clinging to him, confident and trusting in his love. That's why it's so fundamental to our salvation, because our faith is holding on to God's grace and clinging to his favor and mercy. Now, on a pastoral level, what this means is stop looking at yourself for evidence of your salvation, because you will find none, okay? So often we could think, well, you know, I obviously really want to be saved and how can I have assurance of that while I look at my own life? And what are you going to see? You're going to start to look at maybe some of the good things you've done and you'll find that they just weren't good enough. Okay. Well, I did this, but were the motivations proper? Obviously not. Most of the good things we do, there is usually a selfish motivation there as well, expecting a reward, wanting praise. And then, of course, you look at the bad things you've done, which tend to outweigh your the good things you've done, right? You'll look at those. You'll look at the, the failures you keep making, how you, the progress you've been making in your spiritual life just hasn't been as, as good as you'd, you'd hoped it would be. And then, of course, you might actually look at your faith itself. Sometimes you have doubts. Sometimes you wonder, is this all true? Is scripture true? You And, and then you start to wonder, gosh, my faith isn't perfect either. And then you're going to despair and you're going to think, I'm not worthy of being saved and God's not going to save me. Well, the, the fact of the matter is you're not worthy of being saved and nor am I, nor is anyone except our Lord Jesus Christ. If you look to yourself, if you look in the mirror, if you look back on your life, you will find only that which is worthy of damnation. You will not find anything worthy of salvation. And that's a good thing. That's what we expect you to do. If you actually look at your life and go, wow, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good woman. You know, I, I've, I've got this under control. Yeah, I, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a good person. I reckon I deserve to be saved. That's not faith, and that's not repentance. Repentance is, gosh, how on earth can I be saved? And then faith is looking to Christ and seeing that he can and will save you. Repentance is looking at yourself and recognizing that you don't have a drop of your own righteousness. Faith is seeing that Jesus Christ has perfect righteousness and, crucially, trusting trusting that he will give you his righteousness, that his righteousness will be imputed to you, that Jesus Christ's righteousness will clothe you, cover you like a cloak, and therefore when God the Father looks at you, he will see you as being righteous, washed in his son's blood, clothed in his son's righteousness. Okay? That's a really important thing to understand. It's probably one of the most important things that you can understand as a Christian. Repent, look away from yourself, Re recognize that you are not righteous, and don't look for righteousness in your life for evidence and assurance of salvation because it will only lead you to despair. And then look at the righteousness of Jesus and trust that he will clothe you in that righteousness. Also, as a part of this, there is the, the key distinction between the law and the gospel. The law, these are God's commandments, these are God's expectations, should convict you of sin and lead you to repentance. When you read the Sermon on the Mount or when you read the Ten Commandments, you should be thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I, I haven't done that. I haven't, I haven't perfectly fulfilled and obeyed and followed all of that? Have I have I honored my father and mother as much as I can? Have I loved my neighbor as much as I can? Have I loved God as much as I can? Have I never had lustful thoughts? Have I never had angry thoughts? No, no, of course not. Of course not. And that leads you to repentance. You read that and then you go, oh my goodness, God, please have mercy on me. And then you look to Jesus in faith 
And this is where the gospel comes in, okay? So the law convicts you of sin. The gospel presents Jesus Christ crucified on the cross, shows you his righteousness, and then by believing in it, you are clothed in that righteousness. And as Anglicans, we have this beautifully expressed in our liturgy. In the first part of the liturgy, we have the the summary of the law. In the Book of Common Prayer, that's actually the Ten Commandments are read out. And then after that, we confess our sins and then we're absolved. And then the next part, we have the Eucharist, where the gospel is preached to us through the sacrament of Holy Communion. And then by eating the bread and drinking the wine, we therefore place our faith in the gospel promises that are signed and sealed in communion. Okay, so that covers what faith is. It is looking away from ourselves, repenting of the fact that we have no righteousness to speak of, looking to Jesus Christ, recognizing and seeing his righteousness, and then crucially trusting that he will clothe us in that righteousness. It is trusting in God's goodness and grace. Now we're going to look at how scripture impacts all of this. Okay, so if faith is trusting in God's goodness, well, how can we know about God's goodness? If faith is believing and trusting in God's promise, how can we know what those promises are? And that's where scripture comes in. Now, as we talk about scripture, a word is going to come up called efficacious or efficacy. What this means is when we say scripture is efficacious, the words of scripture have a real effect to them. They actually create things. They actually do things. They make things. They're not just dead letters in a book like any other book. They are supernatural. They have a real power to them, as God's words always do. So God, for instance, created the world through words. He spoke. He said, let there be light, and there was light. That's what we mean by God's word is efficacious. In the same sense, when scripture makes you a promise and you trust and believe in that promise, it comes true. So, for instance, in John 3.16, God promises that whoever believes in his son, Jesus Christ, will have everlasting life. That's an efficacious promise. In John 3.16, for instance, God reaches out to you with the promise of eternal life. If by faith you trust in that promise and receive it, it becomes efficacious and you receive the grace contained in the promise. In this case, everlasting life. The words of Holy Scripture become actually the means by which God's grace is imparted to us because those words have an efficacious power. And we see this in Scripture itself. So in John 6, 63, Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. His words are spirit and life. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is living and active. And in John 15.3, Jesus says you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So you are clean, you are righteous, you are cleansed of your sin because of the word that Jesus spoke. If Jesus says your sins are forgiven, He reaches out with that word. Your sins are forgiven. If you apprehend and trust in that promise and you receive it, those words themselves efficaciously give you that grace. In this case, the forgiveness of sins. And in 1 Peter 1.23, St. Peter says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. God's word is so powerful. It is so alive and active that it actually can give you rebirth. Isn't that amazing? And therefore, the words of Holy Scripture have the power to save us. When they give you the promise of salvation and you receive that promise by faith, they efficaciously save you. We see this in the Anglican homilies, which, by the way, are linked in the description below along with the 39 articles. In the first homily, it says this, The hearing and keeping of Holy Scripture maketh us blessed, sanctifieth us, and maketh us holy. The words of Holy Scripture be called words of everlasting life, for they be God's instrument ordained for the same purpose. They have power to turn through God's promise, and they be effectual through God's assistance. And, be, and being received in a faithful heart, they have ever an heavenly spiritual working in them. They are lively, quick, 
and mighty in operation. What a beautiful passage, eh? A beautiful passage about the power and efficacy of Holy Scripture. I'd highly recommend to you that you read that first homily in its in its entirety because it's it's great devotional reading and it really will encourage you to open up your Bible and read the words of God. Now also Martin Luther says in his book The Freedom of a Christian, since these promises of God are holy, true, righteous, free and peaceful words, full of goodness, the soul which clings to them with a firm faith will be so closely united with them and altogether absorbed by them that it not only will share in all their power, but will be saturated by them. Again, this wonderful idea that Holy Scripture's words give you a power. If by faith you trust in that, we receive that grace, we receive that power, which then raises us up and gives us the forgiveness of sins. So the words of Holy Scripture are are God's way of reaching out to us with his promises, with his offer of grace. He reaches out to us and by faith we receive what he's giving us and it has that efficacious power to then save us and justify us. This is explained in Romans 4, for instance, where it is because Abraham believed in God's promises that it is made through God's word, because God spoke those promises to Abraham, that Abraham was saved. It's the promise that's the means by which God saved Abraham because his promise, because his word has efficacious power. Now, onto the sacraments then, how the sacraments affect our salvation. This is often a point that confuses a lot of people. It confused me for a very long time. It leads to all kinds of debates. It's all now that we can see things in this sort of framework of faith being the means by which we receive God's grace and then scripture being the means by which God offers you his grace. This is where the sacraments come in because the sacraments work in the exact same way that Holy Scripture works. In scripture, God offers you his promises. In his sacraments, God also offers you his promises. And in the sacraments, he signs, seals, and confirms the promises he made in the words of Holy Scripture. Because in the sacraments, they're being directly applied to you in a way that can't happen with Holy Scripture. In Holy Scripture, you just take the Bible off your bookshelf and you open it, and there it is. But anyone could read that. In baptism, you yourself are actually being covered in water. In the Eucharist, you yourself are actually drinking Jesus' blood and eating his body. It's being directly applied to you, which signs and seals those promises. But just really important to understand here, the sacraments are efficacious. The sacraments affect your salvation in the exact same way that Holy Scripture does. Not more and also not less. So for Protestants who are a little bit wary of saying that the sacraments are salvific or that the sacraments affect our salvation or that the sacraments save us, even though, of course, Scripture uses that language. For instance, St. Peter says baptism saves you, and Jesus says that if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you will be raised up to everlasting life. Despite that, if we have an issue with, with saying the sacraments are salvific, Remember this, it's scripture salvific? Well, I'm sure everyone will agree it is, right? Well, the sacraments are therefore salvific in the same way. In the sacraments, God also offers to you his grace, just like he does in his word. But because the sacraments, like God's holy word, are efficacious, they become the means by which that grace is applied and transmitted and transferred to you. Just as when God makes you a promise, and if you believe in it, The grace contained in the promise is given to you because of the promise itself, which is efficacious. Same with the sacraments. So to give an example, in Matthew 26, Jesus says of the Eucharist that this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So he's actually attaching promises to the Eucharist. He says in the Eucharist, there is the blood of the new covenant and the promise of the forgiveness of sins. So essentially, the Eucharist communion, the bread and wine on the table, is Jesus Christ offering you his promises of putting you into the covenant and giving you the forgiveness of sins. If by faith you take those promises and apprehend them and trust in them, they actually are efficacious. The Eucharist becomes the means by which that grace, which gives you forgiveness of sins and transferal into the new covenant, is actually given to you. 
but you see how it's always by faith alone. Faith is the instrument by which you apprehend and receive the grace. The Eucharist is the means by which the grace is actually provided and offered to you, just like how it is with the words of Holy Scripture. And we see this in the homily of the worthy receiving of the sacrament, for instance, which says, In the Supper of the Lord, there is no vain ceremony, no bare sign, no untrue figure of a thing absent, but a marvelous incorporation, which by the operation of the Holy Ghost, the very bond of our conjunction with Christ is, through faith, wrought in the souls of the faithful, whereby their souls live to eternal life. So in Holy Communion, there is an operation of the Holy Ghost. If in Holy Communion the promises are made whereby you will be united to Jesus Christ, you'll be made one body of him, that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, that you will be incorporated into his covenant of grace. If the Holy Communion offers you that grace and that promise, and if by faith you apprehend and trust in that promise, there's the operation of the Holy Ghost in the sacrament, and Holy Communion becomes the means by which the Holy Ghost transfers that grace to you, and therefore binds you to Jesus, incorporates you into the covenant, and cleanses you of your sin. And in the homily of common prayer and sacraments, it says, in the sacraments, God embraceth us and offereth himself to be embraced of us. And it also says the sacraments contain the promise of the forgiveness of sins. God embraces us in the sacraments. And we also see this in the 25th article, which says sacraments are ordained of Christ. They are not only badges or tokens of Christian men's profession, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and crucially effectual, effectual signs of grace and God's will towards us by the which so by the they are the means by which he doth work invisibly in us. They are effectual. They are the means by which God works in us. An example of efficacy or effectual promises is, for instance, in marriage ceremonies. When the husband and wife promise that they will be the husband and the wife of one another, that promise actually is called efficacious because... By making that vow publicly before the representatives, before the marriage celebrant, it comes true, and now you're married. Okay, that's ex- exactly how it's working here. When God makes a promise in Scripture or in the sacraments, it becomes true if you apprehend it by faith. Now, this idea, this teaching, is certainly not unique to Anglicans. This is standard Protestant teaching. I will also link an article in the description. It's an article about how Herman Bavink, the Dutch Calvinist uh, Protestant teacher, how he talked about how sacraments save us because of their efficacy, just like how it is of Holy Scripture. Now, because of all this, Holy Scripture and the sacraments are sometimes called provisional means of grace because they are how God provides his his grace to us. And then faith is called the receptive means of grace. It is how we receive what is provided. Through scripture, God announces and declares his promise and the sacraments, God seals and confirms that promise to us individually. And they also efficaciously offer that grace. Now, of course, the sacraments are much more personal than the word because the sacraments can be eaten, they can be drunk, they can be smelled, they can be touched, unlike the words of Holy Scripture. And that's why they sign and confirm and seal those promises because we can have much more assurance in God's grace through the sacraments. And just as a side note, by the way, this is also where uh, we can talk about the salvation of babies and also those who are significantly mentally impaired. So for those who don't have the cognitive ability to read scripture, to know about Jesus, to know about what God has done throughout history, to know about the gospel, well, that's where the sacraments come in. If you baptize your baby, and of course, they your, your child tragically dies before they can reach an age where they could actually hear and learn about the gospel. Well, what happens is in baptism, God gives them his grace. He gives them his promise that's given to them. And until if if they die before they have the cognitive ability to, to recognize that promise and to trust in it, it's just, it's given to them. It's on their account. And so then we, we can therefore have full assurance 
that child, uh, that children, that babies who've been baptized will be saved. So we've already sort of talked about it, but now we can we can really dig into to understanding how it is that faith therefore saves us. Faith saves us instrumentally. Faith is the means by which we reach out and receive God's grace rather than being something that we possess, which the God then rewards through salvation. It's completely different. So a crucial way of explaining things then is that we are saved through faith and by grace. Okay, so in this video, I've said a few times that we're saved by faith. It's probably better to say saved through faith and uh, that we're saved by grace. So we say saved by grace through faith. We see that in Ephesians 2.8, where it says that we are saved through faith because faith is the instrument by which we receive God's grace and it is a gift, it is not something that we did. As Ephesians says, it's not for anything that we that we had. It's not for any any works so that we can't boast. It's entirely a gift. Because to say that faith is something that is rewarded of salvation is to undermine God's grace. It's to say that we did something or we have something worthy of reward. And that is to completely undermine God's grace. That is to say that you have something to boast about. Okay, if faith is intellectual assent, if it's this sort of humble acknowledgement of God, I could boast and I could say, well, you know, I'm so much more humble than those atheists who trust in science. I, I, I recognize that God can do things that are mysterious and powerful. And by trusting in that, I'm a better person than you. And God's going to reward me by saving me. And that's not at all what we're saying, of course. Faith is the means by which you're saved simply because it's just how you reach out and you take what God is offering you in scripture and in the sacraments. We see that in Romans 3, 25, where it says, God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Not God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to reward you for your faith. Not at all what's going on. And that's why John Calvin uses the word instrumental. He says that faith is the instrumental cause of faith. It's simply the instrument by which you grab hold of God's grace. So faith is a reaching out. For instance, think as an analogy of that, of the woman in the gospel who had been bleeding for 12 years. She saw Jesus, she reached towards him, and she trusted that she just grabbed hold of the edge of his cloak, and she trusted that by doing that she would be healed. That's what faith is. Faith is looking to Jesus, reaching out, and trusting that if we just apprehend him in Holy Scripture and apprehend him in the sacraments, that he will therefore give us the grace necessary to save us. That's what faith is. And that doesn't make you a better person. That doesn't make you uh, worthy of reward. The reason why, as we're going to see, is because faith itself is a gift of God created in you. Now, this is all found in the Anglican homilies. So in the homily for Good Friday, we read this. The death of Christ shall stand us in no force unless we apply it to ourselves in such sort that God hath appointed. And what mean is that? Forsooth, it is faith. This faith is required at our hands, and this, if we keep steadfastly in our hearts, there is no doubt, but we shall obtain salvation at God's hands. There again, a homily explaining how faith alone is, is how we're saved. He goes on to say, we must apprehend the merits of Christ's death and passion by faith. All they which behold Christ crucified with a true and lively faith shall undoubtedly be delivered from the grievous wounds of the soul. Let us then steadfastly behold Christ crucified with the eyes of our heart. Let us only trust to be saved by his death and passion, that he may receive us into his heavenly kingdom. Christ Jesus is crucified on the cross before the world. By faith, we look to him, and we apprehend the promise that he made on the cross, that he will forgive us, that his blood does wash away our sins. We therefore receive that grace. And how do we know about Christ crucified? How do we know about his promises? Through the words of Holy Scripture and also through the Holy Sacraments. Now, this idea is, is again, not unique to Anglicanism. It's found throughout Protestant teaching. So, for instance, Article 22 of the Belgic Confession says this, We do not mean, properly speaking, that it is faith itself which justifies us. For faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, who is our righteousness. Jesus Christ is our righteousness in making available to us 
all his merits and all the holy works he has done for us and in our place. And faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with him and with all his benefits. Jesus Christ is the one who saved us by grace, and it's through faith that we receive that grace. And we see this in scripture again. In Philippians 3, 9, St. Paul says, I want to gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So when Paul looked at Jesus Christ's righteousness, when he turned away from any righteousness that he had and saw only Jesus' righteousness and trusted in that righteousness, it therefore became his own, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. By faith, then, we receive Christ's righteousness and are justified. By faith, we receive God's promise of adoption and become his children, mystically united to Jesus Christ by his Spirit. By faith, we receive God's promise of eternal life and therefore will be saved. So then, just to recap, sacraments and scripture are called provisional means of grace. They are the means by which God provides his grace to us. And then faith is what we call the instrumental or receptive means of grace, because it is the instrument by which we receive the grace offered in the sacraments and the words of Holy Scripture. And those words and those sacraments are efficacious. God efficaciously gives us that grace. Lastly, then, just to talk again about grace, how that how it is that all of this is through God's grace alone. It is that faith is not a choice. It is not something that we freely did. It is actually a gift that God supernaturally and monogistically gave to us. To learn more about this, I have a video linked below on Anglicanism and free will, talking about how our faith is entirely a gift of God and not something that we freely chose or dis- or agreed with God that we would have as well. God gave it to us because he predestined us. It is by God's Holy Spirit alone that we believe and trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so even the instrument by which we apprehend and receive God's grace is itself God's grace. The ultimate cause and ground of our faith is therefore the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to recognize the voice of God and thus to hear his voice in Holy Scripture and believe and trust in the promises he makes there. The Holy Spirit also witnesses within us to his witness outside of us. His witness outside of us is then signed and sealed and confirmed in the sacraments. And by faith, we can recognize what God is saying to us in them. If faith is a turning to God, it is God himself who turns us towards him. Now, this is the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role is to direct us towards God the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. So when we say that faith is how we reach towards Jesus, how we grab hold of his grace, this is not to imply that it is a choice that is a result of our free will. We turn to Jesus and see him, and we reach out to him only because of what the Holy Spirit does, only because the Holy Spirit guides and directs us to reach out to Jesus. And therefore, our salvation is wholly attributed to God. None of it is attributed to us. It's entirely a gift of grace. And we can't say, and we can't say, therefore, that we came to faith because we're so smart and intelligent that we figured out that all this is true, or that we're so humble that we decide to assent to Holy Scripture. No, it's all a supernatural gift of grace. And this is, of course, why as Calvinists or as Reformed Protestants, we do have a real issue with Arminianism. Because in Arminianism, if we're going to say that actually your faith does in some sense depend on your free choice, well, then we actually say, well, how do you not have some merit there? How is there not some aspect where you are deserving of a reward? Because, of course, if some people choose not to have faith, but you did choose to have faith, how is that not something praiseworthy? That, that you in your humility or in your intelligence decided to have faith? And is there is there not then some element where your salvation is actually a reward for a choice that you made? And that's why we are so careful and so strict in ensuring that we understand that faith itself is only given to us by God alone. We do this to protect God's grace, to protect the scriptural doctrine that salvation is by grace alone, as we see in Ephesians 2, 8. 
Now, this is important to understand, though, that by our strength and power, we can actually come to believe in and assent to the doctrines of Christianity. You can, by your own intelligence, figure out that Christianity is by far the most logical and reasonable and rational way of explaining the world. Of course, we actually say it is ridiculously uh, obvious that Christianity is true. That if you actually pursued intelligent thought, if you actually pursued reason and logic, you would see that all of this is here because of God and because of the truth we see in Holy Scripture. But what faith is, as we've already seen, is a trust in God's goodness, and that is supernatural. In your depraved and fallen state, you actually can't bring yourself to trust in God. It's not You're not capable of it, and that trust does require the Holy Spirit's supernatural work in you. But the Holy Spirit also gives you the ears to hear, to recognize God's voice. You might be able to intellectually assent to the doctrines of Christianity, but what you might be missing is this relational, this personal, this loving uh, understanding of God and hearing of his voice. You might intellectually believe that scripture is true, but do you actually hear the voice of your father breathing through scripture? That requires a supernatural connection to God that only the Holy Spirit can provide through grace alone. Our faith, therefore, rests on God's power and his prior decision to give it to us. As Jesus says in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And we see this in the homily on the salvation of mankind, where it says, true and lively faith in the merits of Jesus Christ is not ours, but is by God's working in us. And a true and lively faith is the gift of God and not man's only work without God. And also in the homily of the coming down of the Holy Ghost, it says, Faith is plainly the gift of God, and without God's goodness, no man is called to faith or stayed therein. And remember, again, linked below is an hour-long video going into more detail about how the Anglican formularies and scripture, as well as the works of Luther, Calvin, and St. Augustine, teach that faith itself is only given to us by God. Now, for more scriptural content, though, 1 Corinthians 12.3 says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. John 6.44, Jesus says no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And 2 Corinthians 4.6, for God who said let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And lastly, a really crucial text I've quoted many times already, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So it's grace that saves us, which is bestowed on us through the word and sacraments that we receive through faith, which itself is graciously given to us by the Holy Spirit. All of it is God's grace. None of it is your own work. And this is why, again, we can have assurance in God's salvation. If faith was your own work, you might reasonably say, well, what if I lost my faith? Do I have enough faith? But no, no, no. If you trust in God's goodness, then you can then trust that that was supernaturally given to you by the Holy Ghost. And then you can trust that since he gave you that gift, he has predestined you for salvation and you will most assuredly be saved. So just to close this video, I'll give you an analogy. Salvation is not something where... Let's say you are standing here and there's a door in front of you and behind the door stands God and his salvation, but the door's locked. And the only way that God will open the door to you is if you give him the secret password, which is, I believe in Jesus Christ. And then he rewards you for correctly giving the password by opening the door, letting you in, having communion of God and then being saved. No, no, no. Rather, yes, salvation is behind a locked door, but God does not only behind the door. God is everywhere. God is also standing with you, standing beside you. It's God who leads you to the door. It's God who directs you to the door. It's God who reaches out your arm for you to open the door. And then you walk into salvation where God also meets you on the other side of the door. All of it is God's work. None of it is your own. And that's why we can have such trust and assurance in our salvation because it's not you because it is our loving Father. 
And therefore we give all glory and all praise, not to ourselves, but to God and God alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been edifying to you and God bless.